Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rob Biederman. I'm with the SAME National Office, and I'd like to welcome everybody to an SAME Resilience COI webinar, Pilot Testing Resiliency. Before we get started, I want to go over a couple of housekeeping points. If you're connecting through a VPN, you may have difficulties. So if you do, just ditch the VPN. The audio is broadcast through your computer speaker, so hopefully you connected when you were prompted and just turn up your volume and enjoy the webinar. Use the chat tab on the control panel to submit technical issues. I'll be monitoring that and responding on the private tab for your response. At any time during the webinar, submit any questions you may have to the Q&A tab and uh, keep an eye on those questions and upvote those that you would like to see uh, at a higher priority to be answered or that you may have that same question. And this webinar will be recorded for future viewing and, and archived on our um, past webinar uh, archive page. And with that, let's find out who's in the audience. So far, good representation across all the different categories. And as you're answering that question, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Elizabeth Bradford. Elizabeth? Hi, thank you. And I'd like to thank you, Rob and Regina and Karen, for inviting us to present Pilot Testing Resilience, Implementation of AFCEC's Severe Weather Playbook. Next slide. So as most of you know, federal agencies are driving forward efforts to address the requirements of Executive Order 14008. That's the executive order on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad that was passed in January. And funding earmarked for resilience initiatives is coming in both the annual defense budgets and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that was passed on Friday. So now is a really great time to share what the Air Force has done to date around climate resilience, including implementation of the playbook, lessons learned, and the path forward, as well as some project opportunities and examples. So we hope this will help other departments meet the requirements of the executive order on climate change. Next slide. So introductions in speaking order. I'm Elizabeth Bradford. I'm Jacobs Federal Resilient Sustainable Infrastructure Director, and I'll be speaking about federal drivers for climate resilience. Demi Patch is a military master planner, and Bruna Peronis is a climate resiliency civil engineer, and they both work for Jacobs. They'll be presenting the work that we did in late 2020 and in early 2021 um, for completing a severe weather and climate hazard screening and risk assessment for five Air Force Reserve Command installations. Jeff Abelos is the regional planner for AFCAC and the lead for the Air Force's climate resilience strategy. And he's gonna share the Air Force wide results of the assessment and what AFCAC is rolling out next. Kira Zender is Jacob's federal planning director and she's gonna close with some examples of mitigation strategies and funding opportunities. I'm sorry, adaptation strategies and funding opportunities. Then we will answer questions. Next slide. Go ahead. Sorry, next slide. So when talking about climate change and resilience, I'd like to start with definitions. Um, so we'll start with resilience, which is the ability to anticipate, prepare for, and adapt to changing conditions and withstand, respond to, and recover rapidly from disruptions. Now you'll notice the keywords there aren't climate, but are changing conditions and disruptions. So these can be anything, um, cybersecurity, uh, wildfires, um, and climate change pandemics, but we're gonna talk about climate change today. So well, the definition of climate change 
I think most of you have a general sense, but it's variations in average weather conditions that persist over multiple decades or longer. And that encompass increases and decreases in temperature, shifts in precipitation, and changing risks of certain types of severe weather events. But the de definitions of adaptation and mitigation often get a little bit confused. So I'll sum them up and, and give some examples of what those mean. So adaptation is the process of adjusting to the current and future effects of climate change. So think of things like seawalls and natural infrastructure solutions that address sea level rise. Whereas mitigation is how we can reduce the impacts of climate change by preventing or reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So that actually gets into energy solutions that could reduce consumption and emissions from consumption. So let's talk next about some federal resilience drivers. All right. So in 2020, the Air Force developed a severe weather playbook that Demi and Bruna will talk about. And that document was the Air Force's instruction guide for how to implement the military resilience requirements outlined in things like the UFC for master planning and the DOD Directive 47-15-21, which is climate change adaptation and resilience, and also in the defense budgets, the NDAA budget. Next slide. But in January of this year, the executive order 14008, so the executive order on climate change was passed um, and it set forth some additional requirements. It ordered a whole of government approach to addressing climate change and set forth directives that support meeting the administration's GHG reduction targets. It established the White House Climate Policy Office and the National Climate Task Force, which is chaired by the National Climate Advisor and composed of departments and major agencies. So the task force has a pretty broad mandate and they are charged with prioritizing action on climate change in their policymaking and budget processes, in their contracting and procurement, and in their engagement with state, local, tribal, and territorial governments, workers in communities, and leaders across all sectors of our economy. And in response to the various to this, the various federal agencies have been working on climate adaptation plans, which were released in September, and they're also developing implementation strategies. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, please go back. Um, one more. I apologize. So as an example, the Department of Defense's climate adaptation plan establishes five climate adaptation actions that you see to the right. I apologize if you can't see them very clearly, but they are decision making, one, training and a equipping a climate ready force, resilient built and natural infrastructure, supply chain resilience and innovation, and enhancing resilience through collaboration. It also emphasizes community engagement and references three existing programs, which will, the others will speak to, like client, the, including the Com Compatible Use Study, <laughs> CUS, Military Installation Resilience Review Program and the Defense Community Infrastructure Pilot Program or DSIP. And it outlines activities undertaken to date to support installation resilience and provides an implementation timeline. Now the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. So last month, the DOD um, released the climate risk analysis and that um, it includes key security impl impl implications of climate change to the DOD, including the DOD's role in supporting ex the executive order on climate change. The Department of Defense climate policy and responsibilities, including a review of key documents. It includes a review of climate hazards, risks, and security implement implications, but that is for obviously for security reasons, only those that can be released to the public. So it isn't fully comprehensive um, what we can see online, how the DOD will incorporate considerations of climate into relevant strategy, planning and processes, 
And it also includes interagency scientific and intelligence products and experts that can be used to support future analysis of climate risk and uh, funding that is expected for exercises, war games, analyses, and studies related to climate change. So a really comprehensive document that's gonna be the foundation for a lot of what comes next. So while this is a DOD example, the other federal departments are using similar documents, directives, and guidance, and issuing those out to help to meet the objectives of the executive order. So now is really the time to define how that translates from the department level to implementation across an organization's projects and programs, and how to leverage best practices from organizations that are out in front on climate change like the Air Force. Next slide. So now Demi and Bruno are gonna share a case study for implementation of AFCEC's Severe Weather Playbook. Thanks, Elizabeth. So as Elizabeth mentioned, there are now, the DOD now has requirement that mandates military installations to include weather and climate impacts during their master planning process, project design, and programming. So with that in mind, AFCAC developed the Severe Weather Playbook to provide a consistent and systematic approach to identifying those severe weather and climate hazards at their installations. So in order to achieve this, the playbook puts together has three phases. Phase one, what are the hazards that are actually impacting your installation? Phase two, now that you know what those hazards are, what is the level of risk associated with each of those hazards? And then phase three, what are your next steps now that you have this information? So with this guidance provided by AFCEC, Jacobs completed a severe weather and climate hazard screening risk assessment at five Air Force Reserve Command Air Reserve bases. So here you can see are the five locations where we completed the uh, assessment. So as you can see, there's varying climates across the US. We had some of the assessments completed over in the drier, more warm climates in the Southwest up to the more damp, cooler climates in the Northeast. And this really provided us some insight in how the varying climates throughout the US have impacts on different installations. So really before diving into the assessment, as part of this, we put together a list of six assumptions so as an example, number two, we assume that installations adhere to all the existing plans, policies, requirements, and standards. So when working with an installation, if they had a completed, let's say, wildfire management plan, during our analysis, it, we assume that when analyzing wildfire for hazard and risk, that all of the regulations and objectives, goals, et cetera, within their management plan was being followed when determining what level of risk is associated with the hazard. So together, these six assumptions created the foundation for our assessment and really provides a record for the next stakeholder who just becomes involved in this process so they can understand how we put this assessment together and really how these results were achieved. Because at the end of the day, this assessment is not a one-time snapshot in time. We're going to continuously update this as climate and different, cha different environments change. So having this really provided a baseline for our process. So phase one, screening of the hazards. So within the playbook, a hazard is defined as any real or potential condition that can cause mission degradation, injury, illness, death to personnel, or damage to or loss of property. So during the screening process, the playbook provides 26 hazards that are sorted into three separate categories, as you can see on the slide here that really should be evaluated as part of phase one and not only the short term, but also long term. What are we looking at 25, 30, 40 years out? So as part of this process, we evaluated all 26 of the climate hazards presented in the playbook, but also any that may impact bases that aren't listed in here. So as an example, during this process, we worked with some people on the Northeast climates. And after talking to the stakeholders, it became apparent that Nor'easters were severe weather climate imp that impacted the operations at their installations. So during our process, we made sure we included that as well, even though it wasn't listed within the playbook. In addition to screening of the hazards, a really big part is not only understanding each of the hazards, but what each of the, what each of the hazards are and how they're defined. 
And sometimes that's a little easier, right? With something like a tornado, I think we all understand what a tornado is. But others, something like an ecosystem shift, really have to take a step back and think, okay, how does a changing ecosystem impact an Air Force operation? So as part of our phase one, we made sure that we clearly defined each of these hazards. So in the instance of ecosystem shifts, we made sure we included when we defined that ecosystem shifts is really linked to BASH or your bird wildlife aircraft strike hazards. So ultimately phase one is what are your hazards? How are they defined? And do these impacts have any potential harm to your installation? So during this process, we found there were some key steps and tips as well as considerations that were taken. So per the playbook, phase one is really about utilizing existing data. You don't need to generate anything new to complete this part. Really, there are many, many DOD resources as well as public resources that can be utilized such as the Climate Resilience Toolkit that are readily available for this process. And then also engaging stakeholders that are on the installations to validate and verify the information that you've pulled from these resources. And lastly, and very importantly, when going through your hazards, even if you find only one occurrence of a particular hazard, you know, maybe you've only had one hurricane in the last 10 years, it is still very critical that you add it to the assessment so that you can include it to see what level of risk there is and if it's a future hazard. Also, some of the main considerations when determining what hazards or have potential threats to these installations are things like the geographic location of where this installation is located. What is the climate? Are there any historical occurrences of the hazard occurring? Any disaster declarations, future climate data, et cetera. But also what is the physical attributes of the installation? So for an example, if you're working at an installation and with speaking through stakeholders, you find out their stormwater conveyance system isn't very adequate. So even if a location based on weather data may not have frequent heavy rainfall, there still could be a flooding hazard based on the existing infrastructure. So we really made sure when we screened hazards, not only to look at the existing data and weather climate information, but also what is the infrastructure in place at each of these installations. So an example here is how we executed screening of hazards at Dobbins with hurricanes. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see this is a snapshot from the historical hurricane tracks from a NOAA, that's, it's a tool from NOAA. And what you can do, you can put in exact coordinates of a location and then a search radius. And then you can see all the different hurricane tracks that go through that area. So here the snapshot is that blue tick mark represents a Dobbins location. And then the blue dash circle is the study area. And if this were live right now, we'd be able to hover over those lines and see, okay, what was the hurricane, what year it occurred, the category. So using tools such as this one, plus the references listed in the bottom right hand of the, the slide here, we are able to determine that hurricanes are a current hazard at Dobbins, as well as a future hazard based on the projections of NOAA that indicate Atlantic hurricanes are likely going to increase over time due to climate change. So as part of phase one, we did this similar type of process for all the 26 hazards, as well as any additional that were identified by the installations before heading into the next phase to determine the level of risk. So I'm gonna pass it over to Bruna to go over phase two and how we completed that. Thank you, Demi. Once we screen the hazards and selected which are applicable to each of the reserve bases, the next step in the process was to analyze and assess the risk for each of those applicable hazards. Risk is comprised of the probability of a hazard occurring at the base, as well as the severity of impact of that hazard affecting the base operations, training, maintenance, and personnel safety, to name a few. At the center of phase two is this risk assessment matrix you see here on the screen. This risk assessment matrix is a documented resource used in the Air Force Instruction 90802, published in, uh, in 2019, titled Risk Management. As you can see here, the probability ranges from unlikely to frequent, 
and the severity or impact of hazard ranges from negligible all the way to catastrophic. With a defined probability and severity for each of the hazards that Demi mentioned, the resulting risk can be identified. In order to create a comprehensive and objective risk assessment approach, Jacobs identified probability and severity criteria to set up measurable metrics for each probability and severity level. First, we'll go through defining probability. For the severe weather and climate hazards in this assessment, there were two main categories for probability. Hazards that occur over an extended period of time and do not have a clear start and end. These include hazards such as drought, ecosystem shifts, and desertification. The other probability category is a single event hazard. And these are hazard hazards that occur on a regular interval that can be counted and measured as an annualized frequency. Hazards such as hurricanes and tornadoes are good examples of this. All future hazards use a non-single event hazard probability in this assessment because it is difficult to predict the exact number of events that will occur in the timeline of 2045 and beyond, which is the timeline for this risk assessment. As an example for a single event hazard for Dobbins Air Reserve Base in Georgia, there have been four FEMA hurricane disaster declarations in Cobb County in the past 25 years, resulting in a seldom probability of occurrence based off of the risk assessment matrix. For the future probability, NOAA projects that Atlantic or hurricanes will likely increase in frequency over time due to climate change, as Demi had mentioned, elevating the probability to occasional for the future. Now, for a non-single event hazard, such as ecosystem shifts, a more qualitative approach is necessary. So for the air reserve bases, we focus on ecosystem shifts related to animal and bird population changes, such as bash hazards, which are critical to operations and personnel safety. For Dobbins, deer and coyote populations have been increasing in recent decades, and further seasonal changes point to a high probability of occurrence of ecosystem shifts in the area. Therefore, the probability of occurrence for both current and future is likely as you can see here on the screen. Once we've identified the probability of or frequency of occurrence for each hazard, the next step is defining the severity or impact of the hazard to the base. Jacobs developed hazard specific severity criteria to ensure consistency across all five bases and this approach can be replicated for any location. Two examples are shown here on the table uh, for drought and wildland fires or wildfires. So for wildfires, sorry, rather for drought, the US Drought Monitor classifies droughts from abnormally dry with a classification called D0 to exceptional drought classification called D4 based on the drought's intensity. For wildfires, the Air Force actually has the classification system to capture varying levels of wildfire risk, which easily translated uh, to communicate these wildfire severity levels. So that's what we use for the criteria there. An important note here is where there are different severity levels for different operations on the base, the most severe impact was selected in order to capture the highest risk. So say if drought is a moderate impact to maintenance, but maybe a critical um, you know, impact to personnel safety, then it would be a critical severity for drought. So following along with the hurricane hazard example at Dobbins Air Reserve Base, the severity level is negligible because the highest hurricane rating to have passed through Dobbins is a tropical storm. As Debbie had mentioned and shown on that slide, you can easily see um, you know, the, the different categories of hurricanes or tropical storms that have passed through the base within a 200 mile radius, for example. So the severity level is negligible because of this. So Dobbins inland location helps shield the insulation from coastal damages, but the base still experiences tropical storm winds and associated impacts and should be captured in this risk assessment. Finally, with a seldom probability, as we mentioned before, and a negligible severity, 
the current risk rating for hurricanes at Dobbins is ultimately low. And you can see very clearly, um, this is a risk assessment matrix that incorporates Jacobs's uh, hazard specific criteria along with the Air Force's uh, risk assessment matrix. And you can clearly see uh, with a probability of seldom and a negligible severity, the risk rating for Dobbins uh, for hurricanes is low. And so this was conducted for both current and future hazards for all 26 uh, plus hazards that Demi mentioned before. And with that, I will pass it on to Demi to talk through phase three. Thanks, Bruna. So at this point, we know what our hazards are that are impacting the installation, what the risk level is associated so now step three, all right, what do we do now that we know this information? So per the playbook, step three is really about identifying your installation planner as your office of primary responsibility. So now the installation knows what hazards have the highest risk to their installation, using this information to make informed decisions and start prioritizing resources to address those highest risks first. So as part of that, the planner should make sure that they're updating existing documentation with the findings. So they're master planning, making sure that any of the form-based codes are uh, aligned with what we found and not updating that. Or are there existing 1391s that need to include some of the results of this in their justification for a project? Or is there another project that should be programmed as a result of this? So making sure that the installation planner is working with all your internal stakeholders to ensure the results of the analysis is updated in existing documents and programming. But also thinking about how you use this information to select future the siting of future facilities and making sure we're not thinking short-sighted and we're looking at the long-term as well. So you might have a location for a new Milcon building but making sure we think long-term and say, okay, actually in 25 years, the sea level could rise enough to have this whole area inundated. So making sure we're making informed, smart decisions based on this information that we've gathered. And also looking at what's existing. Are there existing facilities and infrastructure that are critical or have a, you know, a high tactical MD, MDI in an area that is in a high risk? So taking this information and coordinating with all your internal people to make sure we're using these results to plan for the future. And then also having the planner as your external coordinator. So they coordinate between your installation and the local community. You know, your planner should be working with local communities to consider different opportunities where you can leverage some funding through um, your, for example, defense community infrastructure program or REPI. Are there certain programs where we can leverage funding to help not only the military installation operations, but also your local community. So really ultimately phase three is about making a game plan to address the identified hazards and the risks, prioritizing your higher risks first. So at the conclusion of this, we really came away with five key takeaways. Your first being research. You know, I can't overstate that enough that there's so much existing data and every day there seems to be more and more resources becoming available. So making sure we're using, researching and using this existing data. Two, engaging your stakeholders. At the end of the day, truly the experts are the people who work on the installation and have been there to experience these events. So the knowledge and insight they have really is critical in this process to validate your data. Third, weather and climate impacts everyone. So whether it was a pilot flying a plane, completing training in a classroom, or you're trying to complete CE functions, weather does impact each person and function differently. So making sure that was considered when developing this assessment. Four, develop a criteria as we've gone over to really ensure consistency in your approach, but also to help ensure your accuracy and really a record. As, all, as I mentioned previously, Ultimately, this should be updated regularly so that it can reflect the most exist the existing climate conditions. So by having a criteria, the next person can look at what you've done and see how it was achieved and are there areas that need to be improved based on new information. And then lastly, and certainly most important, is mission readiness. So 
The entire purpose of this process is to assure that installations are prepared when hazards do occur. So making sure throughout this entire process, you're asking how does this impact the mission is critical when you're looking at all the hazards throughout this process. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Jeff to talk about what's upcoming in the Air Force. Thank you, Demi. Um, I'm Jeff Abelos, and I'll talk about the next steps for the Air Force. Um, so on the screen, here's some results of our severe weather playbook analysis from the Air Force installations. Uh, we have completed a set from over 90 Air Force installations and an additional 20 Arctic sites. Over 1,500 climate severe weather risk have been identified and a total of over 2,000 assessment fields analyzed by the installations. Um, here's a few significant results analyzed from the worksheets. So as you can see, 10% of risk are rated extremely high or high. The top five threats are extreme heat, high winds, heavy precipitation, flooding, tornadoes, and wildfire. They make up 30% of total identified hazards, but 50% of all extremely high ratings. Over 78 Air Force sites are within two kilometers of a coast, and a third of these indicated effects due to storm surge flooding. Air Force bases are scattered among different geographies and climates. Installations should seek innovative and different ideas for reducing risk that meet their unique needs. Now I'll talk more about recent climate-related DOD guidance as briefly mentioned earlier by Elizabeth. Installations are now required to consider severe weather and climate risk during master planning and facility projects. There are DOD instructions and NDA requirements, 10 USC 2846, that require installation master plans to include an installation military resilience component. The Unified Facilities Criteria for Installation Development Plans is for all military services to follow. Each installation must identify and assess the risk to the installation from the effects of extreme weather and climate change and develop plans to address those risks as appropriate. Flood mitigation is also added to the Civil, civil Engineering UFC and takes flood risk into consideration for siting facilities and mitigation strategies. A working template is being developed for the installation climate resiliency component plan, which will be deployed to the installations by the end of December of this year. Uh, once deployed, the installation climate resiliency plan will be completed by installations by the end of calendar year 2023 so this gives two years to complete these component plans. Installation climate resilience plan will ultimately be long in a comprehensive planning platform for a reference for planning and programming decisions. FY20 NDA section 2801 added a requirement for a military installation resilience component with specific requirements. Number one is to ID the risks Number two is to assess Air Force infrastructure. Number three is to review lessons learned. Number four is to ID ongoing plan efforts. Number five is to assess community infrastructure. Number six to address agreements current and planned. And number seven is to apply climate projections. So here's the official definition for military installation resilience. Climate resiliency plans will improve the capability of a military installation to avoid, prepare for, minimize the effect of, adapt to, and recover from extreme weather events, or from anticipated or unanticipated changes in environmental conditions that are necessary in order to maintain, improve, or rapidly reestablish installation mission assurance and mission essential functions. 
Now we'll go over each part of the climate resilience plans and provide a sneak peek before it's deployed. The main focus will be to address the seven required NDA requirements. Installations are to use existing information for completion. So first NDA is risk and threats overview. Risk and threats to military installations resilience that exist at the time of development of the plan and that are projected for the future, including from extreme weather events, mean sea level fluctuations, wildfires, flooding, and other changes in environmental conditions. A summary of risk and threats to military installation resilience using existing information is provided as well as the most important resiliency risk and threats information. When the installation has a detailed study, a summary is included in the section referencing the full study and its completion date. Number two is assets or infrastructure located on the military installation vulnerable to the risk and threats described in paragraph one. The special emphasis on assets or infrastructure critical to the mission of the installation and the mission of members of the armed forces. A summary of assets or infrastructure located in the military installation that are vulnerable to the risk and threats is described. Uh, number three is lessons learned. Lessons learned from the impacts of extreme weather events, including changes made to the military installation to address such impacts since the prior master plan developed under this section. It also includes a summary of lessons learned from the impacts of extreme weather events, including changes made to the military installation to address such impacts. Since the prior master plan developed under this section, is included. Number four is ongoing and planned mitigation projects. Ongoing or planned infrastructure projects or other measures as of the time of the development of the plan to mitigate the impacts and risk and threats described in paragraph one. It includes a summary of projects that partially or wholly contribute to resilience at the installation. Projects include MILCON, SRM, special projects, locally funded public works projects, environmental projects, energy projects, and facilities maintenance. Non-infrastructure mitigation strategies that contribute to installation resiliency include monitoring and specific studies to be completed is also included. Number five is outside the installation. It entails com community infrastructure and resources located outside installation, such as medical facilities, transportation systems, and energy infrastructure that are necessary to maintain mission capability or that impact the resilience of the military installation and vulnerable to the risk and threats described in paragraph one. A summary of items that are necessary to maintain mission capability or that impact the resilience of the military installation and vulnerable to the risk and threats described in section one are included, as well as a narrative describing any coordination with communities outside installation, addressing shared infrastructure and resources for climate resiliency. Uh, number six is public or private agreements, which is agreements in effect or planned as of the time of the development of the plan with public or private entities for the purpose of maintaining or enhancing military installation resilience or resilience of the community infrastructure and resources described in paragraph five. It provides a summary of the public or private entities that maintain and or enhance military installation resilience. It summarizes agreements in effect or plan that enhance military installation resilience or resilience of community infrastructure and resources described in section five. So the last NDA requirement is future risk and threats. 
It's projects from recognized governmental and scientific entities with respect to future risk and threats, including the risk and threats described in paragraph one to the resilience of any project considered in the installation master plan during the 50 year lifespan of the installation. Research of federal, state, local, and scientific entities is made which have information that relates to a future risk or threat to the project. The project or group of projects is listed with reference to the risk or threat and the basis. Also listed are data sources, extreme weather and climate projections used to determine threats and risk and for project development. So this is the bulk of the Air Force Climate Resilience Plan in development. Again, this plan will be developed by the Air Force installations and completed within approximately 24 months. Now I'll hand it over to Kira for the rest of the slides. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. And now I'd like to provide just a couple quick examples of climate resilience implementation projects. Um, but I first want to preface the discussion with a note that climate resilience projects cannot occur in a vacuum, as DOD installations are not islands, but they're linked to the surrounding community by people, community facilities, and key infrastructure, like water and electricity, that can be impacted during storm events. So that is why a key tenet in climate resilience planning and mission sustainment is to work with the surrounding communities to identify avenues for partnership. And DOD is investing in these partnerships with the goal of combating encroachment from a mission perspective, but also developing long-term sustainable partnerships with the community. So next slide. In July of 2019, the Air Force reissued the AFI 90-2001, which provided the um, updates to the Air Force Mission Sustainment Program. And this AFI foreshadows our current climate resilience efforts. Um, and it required planners to identify seven hazards that may impact the mission. And one of them is climate and weather. So in addressing these hazards, base planners can look for ways to protect installations from encroachment through the compatible use program, and also the joint land use studies or JLUS, which are both part of the mission installation sustainment program at OLDCC. Next slide. So previously known as the Office of Economic Adjustment, the newly renamed uh, in January of 2021, the Office of Local Defense Community Co Cooperation, so OLDCC. Um, and through their Military Installation Sustainment Program, OLDCC offers grants, which are targeted at protecting the installation from encroachment, as well as supporting critical infrastructure. And in 2020, they started the DSIP program, which focuses on addressing deficiencies in community infrastructure, installation resilience, and improving military quality of life. And in September of this year, um, OLDCC issued their second round list, which in which they awarded 13 grants totaling $60 million. And this year, the project's focused more on community infrastructure projects. The second grant we wanted to mention was REPI, which has also been around for a long time. Um, it's administered by the Office of Secretary of Defense. And this grant focuses on combating encroachment that can limit or restrict training and testing by preserving compatible open space or conservation areas and working with lands adjacent to military installations. So REPI eligible partners are usually a city, a county, a state, or land trusts. So next slide. So I wanted to pivot back to AFRC and um, give you an example here where our Air Reserve based planners are supporting the 452nd where a compatible use study is being completed with matrix and we're focusing in on encroachment but as of um, September of this year, one of the stakeholders, the Western Municipal Water District was awarded a $4 million resilience grant through DSIP round two. And that project will be focusing on groundwater resilience for March and the surrounding community. Next slide. So our second example is Tyndall. Um, Tyndall was leveled by Hurricane Michael in 2018 and uh, Jacobs was hired to design the installation of the future. And this is a $4 billion rebuild. But in order to have the funds approved by Congress, the Air Force had to make a commitment that they would build back stronger and more resilient 
with a combination of higher standards for elevation and wind speed, uh, sustainable master planning, integrated stormwater management, and nature-based coastal resilience. So we conducted a series of workshops with base leadership um, where we explored a variety of sustainable, resilient, and smart strategies to support the installation of the future. And one of these strategies was coastal resilience, um, looking for ways to mitigate risk along the 40 miles of coastline for Tyndall. Next slide. And in addressing coastal resilience, uh, the team worked with Dr. Todd Bridges of the U.S. Army Corps ERTIC Engineer Research and Development Center to identify engineering with nature solutions or nature-based solutions. And we stood up in a resilience working group with local, regional, state, and national stakeholders to collaborate on coastal resilience activities that not only supported the base's mission, but also social and environmental benefits to the community. And this collaboration led to the identification of third-party funding to support nature-based coastal solutions. Our next slide. And in September of this year, um, the Nature Conservancy, our third-party grantee, was awarded a $4.8 million REPI challenge grant to design and permit four of these Engineering with Nature pilot projects that are shown here on the slide. So we're very excited to get this project going and looking forward to that opportunity. So next slide. Okay, so just in closing, Air Force Reserve Command and the Severe Weather Assessment was a really great opportunity for us to implement the AFCEC playbook and help AFRC identify their climate risks that may impede their mission at their bases. And as any good planner will tell you, you need a plan and not just any plan, but actually a roadmap and a strategy to get where you need to go on time and to finish the race successfully. So as a reminder, um, this is not a marathon. This is a marathon, but not a sprint, right? So we're, we have to have a plan and a strategy. And Jeff's presentation um, shows our, the Air Force's next steps, that the Air Force does have a strategy to enhance installation resilience by providing good data, an objective framework to analyze the information, and ways to prioritize key projects, balancing risk and probability of occurrence. And once these risks are identified, um, planners can develop projects and priorities, some of which may be funded in the short term through programs like DSIP or REPI, and others which may be a little bit longer in vision or larger vision, which can be funded and developed over time. So with that, we'll close out the presentation, and I think Elizabeth's ready to help us with any Q&A, moderating the, the chat. Thanks, everyone. So I've been I've been monitoring the Q, uh, monitoring the Q and A, and we have some questions. So I'll start with the the first one uh, from John Huddleston. Did you review the installation all hazards threat assessment (AHTA)? Bruna, can you help us with that? Sure. Thanks, Elizabeth, and thanks, John, for the question. So if a reserve base had any previously conducted risk assessments, we absolutely reviewed those and incorporated relevant material into the severe weather and climate risk assessments. Um, we are aware of the all hazards threat assessments, the AHTA, and if a reserve base has one at the time of the assessment, right, it should definitely be fed into the document review. The Civil Engineering Squadron was part of the stakeholder process and part of the workshops and all the installation emergency management plans were also reviewed uh, for this risk assessment. Great, thank you. And I think this is another one for you. Um, is the severity component of phase two based only on location or does it take into account facility asset specific attributes that might place them at a high criticality to DOD or make them highly vulnerable per, to a particular hazard? Sure. So ye yes and no. Um, so the yes part of that is we did look at, you know, critical parts of, of the base, such as, for example, the runway, right? If the runway is flooded, you can't take off. And so that's obviously uh, more of a critical severity. But in terms of looking at the exact buildings that are that are mission critical, um, that wasn't part of the scope of this first assessment. And um, that's a recommendation that we had to, to look more deeply into, OK, you know, if, if 
this building and that building are the most critical to operations, those should be the ones that are focused on, right? Because say, you know, um, hurricanes are a high hazard, high risk, um, then those buildings should be focused on from here on out for the risk mitigation measures. Right, so we focused on the installation scale and, and we zoomed in on things we knew were critical, but not at the building scale. Exactly. Yep. yep. All right. I'm looking through the Q&A and seeing what I come up with. Get, bear with me. I think the other question, uh, does the DOD climate adaptation plan include recommendations for risk adaptation measures for existing sites that planners may not be suggesting new locations for anytime soon. I'm a, I'm a little confused by that tail end of that question, um, but I think I don't. Kira, do you? Can you answer that? Are we struggling? I think, with we, need, I think we need a little clarification on on the question. I think so too. All right. So, Julian, if you could provide a little clarification on that question, that would be helpful. Any other questions? Okay. I'm not seeing anything else. I'll give folks a minute to get some clarification on Julian's question about the climate adaptation plan. Okay. Well, I don't have anything new. <laughs> so, oh, here's one. Will the infrastructure bill help speed up some of the projects? I haven't dived into um, the details of the infrastructure bill, what actually ended up finally getting passed. But my feeling is, yes, there's a number of bases that have projects, if we're just speaking about military installations, um, there, there's a number of installations that have projects that they they would love to implement if they had funding. And so there's definitely some things that are shovel ready or close to shovel ready. And with these funding mechanisms, they're able to, to um, take advantage of that. Jeff, do you have anything to add to that? No, I don't. Okay. All right. Um, and then we got some clarification on the other question, I believe. Um, where did it go? Um, does the DOD plan or the Air Force playbook suggest ways to adapt to specific hazards, e.g. flood walls for storm surge? I don't and correct me if I'm wrong, Demi and, Demi and Bruna, but I, I don't feel like the playbook actually specifies um, adaptation strategies that are like specific project types. Right. Yeah, Elizabeth, that, that's correct. As part of the playbook for phase three, there is a section that shows some examples so maybe it might suggest updating some GIS layers to more appropriately reflect flooding, but the playbook itself doesn't necessarily suggest ways to adapt. I think part of phase three is coming up with your team on your installation to think of those innovative ways to address some of these. Um, the, the Dobbins mitigation plan that we developed, um, we, we did the, we did the, for, we did five risk assessments, hazard screening and risk assessments. Then we did the hazard mitigation plan for one facility. Um, and in that one, we did include some adaptation project examples and, and Kira spoke to some of those today. So I hope that answers the question. So we, 
we gave the installation some flexibility on how they want to deal with their issues. And the next steps, of course, is to identify the issues, um, identify the infrastructure affected by those issues. And then when we get to that phase, then we'll start getting into mitigation. So um, it's a little bit down the road, but um, there is a little bit guidance on it in the playbook on mitigation strategies. Great. Thank you. And the, uh, another question for uh, Bruna, for your analysis of potential hurricane impacts, did you consider an increase in frequency as well as increase in intensity? Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you, Chris. I see here you posted the question. So for the first part of that question, did you consider an increase in fr frequency? So that's part of the probability, right? So when you go to current hazard to future probability, you look at that increase in frequency. And then for the second part, for the severity, that's where you look at the increase in intensity. So, um, you know, in 25 years and beyond, which was the timeline of current to future, that's where the increase in intensity was reflected. It was in the severity. So because the risk is the probability times the severity, it's, it's incorporated in, in both the frequency and increasing intensity. Great. Thank you. I am not seeing any other questions. So Rob, would you like to take it from here? Thank you, Elizabeth. And I want to thank uh, Elizabeth and all our presenters for the great presentation today. And I want to thank all the attendees for taking time out of your day to join us for this webinar today. So keep an eye on your inbox for other notifications of other SAME webinars on our website as well. And again, thank you to our presenters. Uh, we very much appreciate this. And these things can't happen without you. So thank you very much. And we'll see you all in our next webinar. Thank you for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.